esteemed members of the steering committee and master jury and our partners from the Al Khan Award for Architecture to this first session of a three sessions webinar series celebrating and learning from the winning projects of the Al Khan Award for Architecture 2017-19 cycle. Thank you for sparing time to be here with us today. This idea germinated in my conversation 
with Farooq Darakshani, as he had promised a post-award seminar this year in Pakistan, and because of the prevailing pandemic, this was not possible. Well, clouds do have silver linings. Not only we have speakers and panelists who otherwise may have been constrained to travel, but participants from almost more than 15 countries and also remote areas of Pakistan. Our registration exceeded the Zoom capacity of 500 and the rest uh, can follow live on Facebook. The awards, a vision of His Highness the Aga Khan has immense following. And for the first time, the seminar has become a webinar reaching out to many architects and students at the same time. In putting together this exciting series, I'm particularly grateful to Farooq Darakshani and the AKAA team, my colleagues at the Institute of Architects Pakistan National Council, especially President Chinghezi for his full support, and Honorary Secretary Bisma Askari for the untiring efforts in single-handedly managing the graphics, publicity, and the entire online setup and more. Now, the President of Institute of Architects Pakistan, architect Arif Chinghezi, will formally welcome you all to the IAP AKAA webinar series. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and a very good afternoon from Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, we are delighted and honored at the Institute of Architects Pakistan to host the first webinar series of the award-winning projects of Aga Khan Award for Architecture for the cycle 2017 and 19 in collaboration with Aga Khan Award for Architecture, one of the most prestigious awards in our profession founded by His Highness the Aga Khan in, in 1977. The webinar series, as you all know, presents the winning projects uh, by their architects, joined by the members of the steering committee, master jurors, and project reviewers from Aga Khan Award for Architecture cycle 2017 and 19. Uh, today is the first of uh, the three uh, uh, session series in which we are going to witness the two award-winning projects and listen to the proud architects and the panelists. Uh, my special thanks to both the presenters of today, architect Nora al Sayeh, Sayeh from Bahrain uh, for her project revitalization of Maharak, and Natalia Fishman from Russian Federation for her project development of uh, public spaces, who will be presenting their award-winning projects, not only to IP members, but also to the architects from the Member Institute of Arc Asia, a 21-member Architects Institute of Asia, Commonwealth Association of Architects, and UIA. IAP feel proud to be associate, associated as, as a member with all the three international bodies of architects. My thanks uh, also goes uh, go to the architect uh, Francesco Benderin, member uh, steering committee and architect Muna Fawaz, um, master jurors, uh, along with the two project reviewers, uh, uh, Mr. Sefer Rashidi and Dr. Anna Grinstein, for uh, joining us in today's webinar session. Uh, I'm particularly uh, thankful to architect planner Farooq Darikshani Director Aghan Award for Architecture and my two colleagues in IAP, architect uh, Khadija Jamal Shaban, uh, who is the chairperson of our Board of Architecture uh, uh, Education in IAP, and architect Bisma Askari, honorary secretary IAP, for their hard work and extraordinary effort for, uh, for the past many weeks uh, in making this webinar series possible. We are pleased that as much as 500 plus participants have joined us today and, is and, and they are going to join us today in this uh, virtual session, apart from the unspecified number of viewers joining through IP's Facebook where it is being streamed live. In today's multiple, uh, uh, in today's multiple challenges to the profession of architecture in the wake of global warming, uh, rapid urbanization, environmental degradation, energy crisis and coupled with the latest ongoing pandemics crisis, there is a greater need for a closer partnership among the architects and the institutes and bodies they are part of. I hope this collaboration with Aga Khan Award for Architecture for the webinar series will explore possible avenues for more cooperation which could positively impact the built environment around us. In closing, I wish to express my gratitude to all the participants for being part of this session I am honored to have had this opportunity, opportunity of welcoming you all. I hope we have the most absorbing session with interesting and stimulating discussions and exchange of knowledge with the two star presenters and the esteemed panelists so that, so, so that together we could 
take greater inspiration out of these fantastic projects being presented today. I'm thankful to all of you for your hearing. Okay, uh, before I hand over the mic for the rest of the day to Faro, just uh, one housekeeping thing that is, um, if there are any questions, please put it out in the Q&A apart and all the questions will be taken up for any panelist. If there's a particular one you want to address, please say so to the speaker or the panelist or general questions and Farooq would moderate. Now, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Farooq Darakshani, who is the director of the Aachen Award for Architecture. He has been associated with the award since 1982, where his work has brought him into contact with architects, builders, and planners throughout the world. He travels extensively in Muslim countries and has organized and participated in numerous international seminars and parochia, dealing with contemporary built environments. He has collaborated on a large variety of publications and exhibition on architecture and has been involved in organizing professional workshops and international architectural competitions. He lectures widely and has served as a jury member at schools of architecture in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Mr. Darakshani's main field of specialization is the contemporary architecture of Muslim societies. And his professional work has included the design and construction management of large scale public works and infrastructure projects in Iran, as well as architectural design in Paris and Geneva. He also serves on boards and committees of a number of cultural institutions. In 2018, he was now named an International Fellow of Riva, Royal Institute of British Architects. Farooq Darchani is trained as an architect and planner at the National University of Iran and later continued his studies at the School of Architecture in Paris, UPR. Over to you, Farooq, for the rest of the session. Uh, thank you, Khadija. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good um, day to everyone, because as uh, uh, RF uh, Changizi, uh, President Changizi said, you've been coming from 15 different countries. This is a great pleasure, and it's a way to disseminate what is the award, message of the Arc and Award for Architecture. Um, after each uh, award ceremony that uh, the, all the winners are um, celebrated, we try to go to each different country and celebrate with the people there, and then go around the world organizing seminars, um, exhibitions, to not only to present a project, but to see what we can learn from these projects. Because each of these projects, they're not, very, they're not only site specific, there's a lesson to be learned that can be implemented in many other places. So this is a, the first of these webinars that we're having. We're gonna reach more people, I hope, and this will help us in getting questions and answers from, as you said, the most remote places, where people do not have the opportunity to access us. Um, I would just make it quite short going to the presentations. Um, the first presentation that we're gonna have is the Bahrain, uh, a project in Bahrain, the Muharra, the revitalization of Muharra. I have had the opportunity to visit the, all, all the, um, almost all the winning projects and the shortlist of projects. And Bahrain is one of the projects which has really impressed me a lot. I had seen it many years ago. I had been in Bahrain in 2007, 8, and I've seen the project, how it is involved. It is on the vision and an ongoing vision of uh, Her Excellency Sheikh Mai Al Khalifa, who she was a minister of culture. But at the same time, the dedicated team that has been working with her all these years. Noura Al Saya, she is the key person in this project. And um, I've known Noura through this project, but she's been uh, born and brought up in the vicinity in, um, in Geneva, where now our offices are, and she's gone to the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. That's where she studied architecture. And then from there, she has had some experiences in architecture in Holland. Later, she went to Bahrain, and since then, she's been working as an architect, she is responsible for the, all the affairs of the Ministry, for, um, our ministry of uh, um, Culture, which is now called the Bahrain Authority for Culture Antiquities. She is the head of the architectural um, affairs. Besides that, 
she's been curating a number of very important um, exhibitions. And uh, in, I remember when it, in Venice, if some of you have been architects who've been to, you heard about the Biennale in Venice in 2012, that the Bahrain Pavilion won the award. She was the responsible, she was the commissioner and she was in charge of that. Recently, uh, she did the, the uh, also in uh, Amman, the design, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, design week in Amman was created by Noura. And one of the other ones, which you can, we, I hope that she will explain a bit more, is when she was responsible for the pavilion, Bahrain Pavilion in Milan e exhibition, which he, and this is an exceptional because I would like her to, if she can in the middle, explain that how a project has been transplanted from uh, Milan all the way to uh, uh, Mohara. Um, now I hand it over to Nora. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Farouk, for this uh, very nice introduction. And thank you very much, Khadija, for organizing this. It's a really nice occasion to reconnect with so many people um, after these few months of being uh, a bit disconnected and to be able to share uh, a project that we've been working on here in Bahrain as Farouk uh, introduced. Uh, the project that I'm going to be talking about um, is the revitalization of uh, Muharraq, which com comprises two different projects. The Purling Path, which was initiated in 2011, and prior to that, uh, the Sheikh Ibrahim Center for Culture and Research, which was established in Muharraq in 2002. And both these projects, as Farouk uh, very well introduced, are really the vision uh, of Her Excellency Sheikh Amey bin Mohammed Al Khalifa, who um, in 2002 really wanted to reinvest and rehabilitate the old city of Muharraq uh, in Bahrain. So the old city of Muharraq, as you see here, this is a beautiful image from the 1950s, is one of the of two main cities uh, in Bahrain and the islands of Bahrain and archipelago. And the islands of Muharraq have been known. Um, throughout history for pearl diving. So Muharraq's uh, development has been associated with uh, the economy of pearling uh, since the time of Dilmun. The Dilmun civilization had its capital in Bahrain uh, 3,000 years before Christ. And to the left of the screen, you see one of the oldest first piers that were uncovered in an archaeological site in Shahura in Bahrain uh, from 3,000 uh, before Christ, so it's a 5,000 year old pierced pearl that really testifies to the really long legacy of pearl uh, fishing in Bahrain. And to the right of the screen, one of the later uh, eras of the Tylos civilization, where you also see this is one of the beautiful um, pieces of pearl jewelry that were uncovered in Bahrain. So really the history of Bahrain has been linked to that of uh, the history of Perling. This is uh, a really beautiful image from 1913. Uh, oyster shells in front of one of the per uh, German pearl traders that used to come to Bahrain to buy uh, pearls. Uh, it looks like it's an enormous amount of pearls, but actually to find one pearl, you need to uncover approximately 10,000 oysters. So this is probably around three, four pearls that you see here on this image. Uh, and the pearling industry really reached its apex uh, in the 1930s. There's a very famous uh, story linked um, to the purchase of the Cartier flagship store in, uh, in New York that was traded in 1917 uh, with this two-piece strand of curl, pearl necklace that you see here that was owned by, um, the, the townhouse was owned by a lady called Maisie Plant, and such was the value of pearls at the time that she exchanged this two-piece strand pearl of necklace that was estimated in 1917 for $1.5 million for um, the walk-up that she had inherited from her husband on Madison Avenue, that up to today are still the headquarters of the Cartier uh, flagship store in New York. So this pearl industry, um, you know, there was a craze for pearls until the 1930s. And what's really beautiful, and here is the link to urbanism, is that this 
uh, economy built the city of Muharraq. So this is an aerial view of the city of Muharraq uh, in 1970s. And everything you see here on this image is directly related to the economy of pearling. So these very small pearls built a whole city and built the economy and the society that lived around it. Obviously, it happens with many, many countries as a result of the collapse of the pearl economy, uh, you know, the, ri the rise of the oil economy in Bahrain, urban development. The city of Muharraq uh, today uh, looks a lot different than it did uh, up until the 1970s. The relation to the sea has changed very much. But as you can see here, we're quite lucky that the, the core of the urban fabric has been preserved. Um, and it still remains up until today one of the most extensive uh, urban, uh, urban patterns from the Islamic era on the Arabian side uh, of the Gulf. And so the idea behind the, the project that was initiated in 2007 was to rehabilitate the old city of Muharraq through the history and the legacy of Perling. So the project Pearling Path Testimony of an Island Economy was registered on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2011. It was a serial nomination uh, that comprises 17 monuments that each relate and narrate part of the, of the story of pearling in Muharraq. So there's the house of the pearl diver, the house of the captain, and all of these houses are connected by an urban pathway that takes the visitor through all the old neighbor, all the old historic neighborhoods of Muharraq. Um, the plan then, as it went through implementation beyond what was registered on the, on the UNESCO, grew to accommodate uh, a number of public uh, spaces that were essential to the contemporary needs of the city, multi-story car parks, and a number of other cultural infrastructure um, that helped make the city once again a living city. So as you see, this is one of the images from the alleyways of Muharraq. Obviously, through, you know, from the height of the pearling economy until today, the, the architecture legacy, let's say, was dilapidated like happens in many historic cities. It was in need of a lot of maintenance, of rehabilitation and so on. But like I said previously, we were really lucky that the, the urban profile of the streets, of the heights of the buildings and so on were still preserved. And it was really a richness uh, and a heritage that we were working very much um, to preserve. So one of the main challenges of the project, because it's a serial nomination, was to look at how we could connect all these different monuments within the city. Uh, and we worked on this with a Belgian office, two Belgian offices, Bureau Bas Metz in collaboration with office Kirsten Kers, David Ben Severin, that proposed from a start um, an intelligent uh, approach to this, which was, you know, not to create a continuous uh, new urban entity within the urban fabric, but to add on the existing fabric a number of uh, of small wayfinding elements from that, that are lighting poles and more importantly, to create a series of public spaces in open areas in the city that would serve as places of encounters between the residents, visitors to the path and tourists to create places where people could meet in the city. So these are an example now uh, of the lighting elements that have been uh, installed in Muharra. Um, they're really quite helpful because they guide people in a natural way to follow the purling path. Uh, and this is one of the examples of the, of the public squares. This is an, Im uh, an image obviously before the installation uh, of the square. These spaces were uh, spaces where there had been uh, houses that were built, that had been demolished, that were left vacant. Most of the time, these open plots would be quickly filled up by cars because parking is one of the main problems that the city faces. Uh, and by reintroducing uh, spaces, these, uh, let's say, non-places became very lively spaces in the city where people could sit on a bench, could interact. There is uh, a canopy of, uh, of vegetation that creates a microclimate underneath. And these are um, some other images uh, of these squares. Alongside the public spaces, obviously, the core of the project is really the rehabilitation of these historic uh, monuments. This is an example of uh, the Fakhro House, which was the house of a, of a pearl uh, merchant 
who was dealing not directly in, in pearls, but in timber and ropes and other materials that were related to the pearling industry. This is one of the most beautiful architectural examples of uh, the how the Mejlis, so the meeting place of the Siyadi family, which were one of the most prominent and wealthy pearl merchants uh, in Muharraq. This is the inside of the Mejlis. So this was this Mejlis was built in the 1940s, 1950s, so towards the end of the pearling era, but it shows already the wealth that the pearl uh, merchants had, that they were starting to express um, their wealth on the outside of the buildings, which normally um, in Bahrain and in the Arabian Gulf, expressions of decoration or wealth were normally confined to the inside of the homes. So this is, it shows the position that the pearl merchants were uh, earning in society. This is a proposal by Studio Anna Holtrop that's currently under construction. One of the old houses, the Murad um, house that will be transformed into a small guest house in the, along the path. So it was really important for us that all these different uh, properties that were inscribed as monuments um, under the UNESCO World uh, Heritage List, that they have different programs that make sure that the city is, is lively, that they're not only exhibition spaces, but that they fill a variety of programs that are missing and needed in the city. Alongside the preservation of the monuments, the preservation of the urban fabric was probably the most challenging aspect of the project. So the path itself uh, snakes through the old city of Maharraq over a distance of three kilometers and a half. Over these th this three kilometers and a half, there are around 400 uh, facades or, or let's say buildings that form part of the urban fabric that are really also an essential part of the, of the project. So this is part of the project that we call the facade upgrade or urban rehabilitation. These 400 facades were all surveyed by a team of volunteers uh, in collaboration with the University of Bahrain. And each one of those facades we then um, drew and proposed an urban rehabilitation screen uh, just to maintain, for example, to remove ACs from the, from the facades, to clean up storefronts, to rehabilitate and conserve uh, old buildings that are made out of coral stool in an effort to really um, make, you know, that the, the project is not only about monuments, it's about the urban fabric and the whole, and really that the project should serve as a catalyst for the urban rehabilitation of the historic city um, in its entirety. Um, in addition to that, there are some larger projects within uh, the Purling Path that correspond to more contemporary needs of the city. This is, for example, the Purling Path Visitor Center that acts like a community center for the city as a, on the whole, that's developed, was designed by the Swiss architect Valerio Oljati. Um, the, the location of the visitor center is in a very important historic location for Muharraq. It's located on the site of the former warehouses that we call Amarat. And these warehouses were, like you see this historic uh, picture here of the site, were at the threshold between the sea and the suit, the commercial areas of the, the city. And they had a very particular um, longitudinal uh, shape within the city to mitigate this passage between the sea for the goods and, um, and the commercial street. So you see this is uh, an aerial view of Muharraq today where you can see an aerial uh, view of the city. I think you can't see my cursor, but it's uh, there somewhere in the middle. You'll see it when I get to the next slide. Um, and although the, Amara, the ruins of the Hamara exist on the site, what was really important in the project was to reintroduce this urban typology in the city and to reinstate it. So the, the project um, bridges uh, the two sides of the plot through a 7,000 square meter roof that creates an important uh, open public space within the city for people to gather. And at the same time creates uh, a scenography of the rooms of the old Amaras that you see underneath. And this is here within it, um, the, the visitor center itself that has a community center that has a small exhibition space and workshop spaces uh, for com activities geared towards the community. And this is the view of the visitor center uh, from the exterior on Avenue 10. 
Um, for us, one of the important things within this project was really that it was really important for us to conserve and rehabilitate the old structures, but it was also very important to us that when we built something new in the city, we did so with a contemporary expression. Um, we really believe that, you know, this is not only a question of style, but it's really a question of believing that we as a society today um, can also build monuments and buildings of value who hopefully in 100, 150 years will in turn be valuable enough to be preserved. Um, you know, alongside uh, the projects that tackle the culture, like I mentioned, parking spaces uh, are one of the contentious, contentious issues yeah, within this. So as part of the project, we're also in for multi-story that uh, will add a thousand parking to the city and will help in easing uh, traffic and congestion and uh, the lack of public spaces within the city. Alongside that, we also have projects that um, tackle the intangible uh, heritage of the city. For example, in this case, the Fijiri uh, traditional uh, singing that used to be brought early um, so this is a project for the expansion of an existing dar uh, in in Muharraq along the purling path that was a, designed by Office Kirsten Khers David Van Sederen. And uh, typologically, it was a bit of a challenge because the dars normally happen uh, traditionally in a majlis setting, which is a setting that's quite interiorized. And yet at the same moment, uh, there was a need or a, an ambition for more visibility for these forms of, of, um, of dance and singing in the city. Um, and, and at the same time, we did not want to compromise the traditional uh, typology of the, of the majlis. So the design intent that came out is a, is a building, like you see, that can be completely sealed off when there are practices or when there are uh, classes going on. And when there is a public performance, the whole uh, facade of the building uh, goes up. The interior uh, glass facades as well open up completely to the street and the performance completely opens up to the streets of Muharraq where the audience becomes the whole city uh, itself. And this is one of the, of the night views of the project. Um, and this is, uh, Farouk will be happy to know that I had included this in my presentation. Alongside that, we have other cultural infrastructure, uh, contemporary cultural infrastructure that we've also introduced to the, to the city. This is an image of our pavilion at the Milan Expo in 2015 that was on the theme of agriculture uh, and food sustainability. So it, is, it was a series of 10 uh, fruit gardens uh, in an open plant pavilion. An important part of our, of our pavilion was that the pavilion will be dismantled after the six months of the expo, uh, shipped back to Bahrain and rebuilt um, at a location where it would serve as a botanical garden. Um, and actually, when we had this idea to dismantle it after we chose the winning competition uh, project by Studio Anna Holtrop, we didn't actually have a site yet in mind. Um, and by a very happy coincidence, we had started working on the purling path at the same time um, and looking for an available uh, plot, it came to mind that we had uh, this, purchased this plot that we had no use yet for, uh, that by a very lucky coincidence nearly fit the pavilion exactly. Um, we just had to make a few amendments to the length of the pavilion, but otherwise it fit perfectly in, in, uh, in width. So you can see it here inserted next to the house of Sheikh Isa bin uh, Ali al Khalifa, the house of the former ruler of Bahrain, really at the heart uh, of Muharrat, um, where it exists today amongst all the other uh, historic buildings uh, of the city. And I'm going to end with a last uh, project that I actually um, designed in collaboration with an architect and friend of mine, Leopold Vanchini, which is a small um, ex exhibition space for architecture that's part of the Sheikh Ibrahim Center for Culture and Heritage. 
Um, and the, the brief here was to design a space within Muharraq that would tell the story of uh, architecture in the city and how it evolved and would house at the same time the archives of, uh, of, of Belgrade, who was an architect that lived in Muharraq in the 50s and that surveyed a great deal of historic houses. And this was obviously a challenge to try to understand how you exhibit architecture within uh, an a historic city. And what was beautiful about the plot that we had, it was a very narrow plot um, that had two adjacent buildings on either side. So a plot that was quite representative of the, the urban plots within the city. And what was really beautiful when we discovered the site is, was that there were all these old walls uh, that were existing on either side of the building and each one of those walls had a different texture, was built in a different uh, era and these walls actually told best the story of um, the evolution of architecture in Muharraq. So the idea behind the project was to offset our building from the two adjacent uh, existing walls. Normally uh, the way um, the buildings are built in Muharraq, you would have built another blind wall against these walls. So the texture of the existing walls would have disappeared. So we decided, like I said, to offset the walls and to glaze them and that the project would have a bridge-like structure that would cantilever from either side uh, of the site, revealing all the existing walls uh, of the building. And at the same time, you know, one of the challenges sometimes of exhibiting um, of, or of exhibition spaces um, that are interiorized in these traditional courtyard spaces is that they can be a bit disconnected from the street and from the local communities uh, around them. So it was also equally important for us that the exhibition space could completely become one uh, with the outside street, both the adjacent streets uh, on the side of the building, but also the the pedestrian streets and when there are any exhibitions uh, in this space, the whole space opens up and becomes a natural part of the street. So that's it. There are obviously, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing project and there are a lot of projects that are still under construction that we're very happy to see um, completed hopefully within the next year. Um, but this is where, where the project is at the moment. And uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to share it with you today. Thank you, Noura. It, it was a, it's a difficult project to present because you have not shown so many other buildings in it. And if you, Pakistan is not very far from Bahrain. So when everything is okay, I think some, people, some of the architects should go and visit. Noura yeah. will be... Uh, and I think you can make an architecture tour of Muharraq for them. Thank That's you very much. Pleasure. Safe. Now you tell us all the things that Noura didn't say. All the, she said all the good things. You can say whatever you want. You're free. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, hello, everyone. And thank you, Noura, for a really enlightening presentation. I mean, it was really a privilege to visit Muharraq and to meet Noura and her other colleagues. And I think it's a remarkable project for many, many reasons. One of them is that it's very thoughtful um, and often government sponsored projects want to accomplish things in a big rush. I think one of the remarkable things about this project is that it recognized that to do things well, you have to take time, especially at an urban scale. It's incremental, you learn, you develop, you do new things. And the 20 years or so that the project has been going on has definitely been to its benefit. It's definitely to the credit of the people behind it that they realize that it's not the kind of thing you can achieve in a year or two. And I also think it's remarkable that it's government sponsored because generally government projects are efficient, but they're not often as thoughtful as this one. Um, another thing which, I, which impressed me very much when I visited was the fact that it had thought of the local community. Um, and many of the squares that Noura showed, actually they serve local the local community, including uh, migrant workers and people from other countries by providing very pleasant, small spaces where people can relax, can meet a friend. Um, and I think this idea of how can um, urban renewal and how can, how can urban revitalization be to the benefit of local residents is a very important one. And the Mohara project does it really well. More so, um, 
the, the project also partners with different stakeholders, including many of the former residents and landowners and people with link, historic links to Muharraq, um, many of whom have a very strong identity and feel that they belong there, even though they may have no longer lived there or have moved out 30 or 40 years ago. And there's definitely a renewed interest, a commitment on the part of people from Muharraq and I think if you come to assess and to evaluate a project, what you really want to see is that beyond the initiators of a project is a response that's encouraging and sustainable and will take it forward. And I definitely felt that, for example, the boutique hotel that Noura showed is a joint project between uh, her authority and the owners of the house who are extremely excited and they have a WhatsApp group with hundreds of family members. And they can't wait for this project to go ahead because they see it as a revival and a renewed interest in their own family history. So I think that's great. The conservation is also really thoughtful. Um, and, and I think this contrast of amazingly meticulous, uh, accurate conservation with bold modern architecture that fits into a historic setting is very rare in historic environments because usually people are too afraid to introduce modern elements uh, whereas in this case, they've managed to handle it so well that a modern building like the music hall or any of the, or the pavilion or any of the others that Noura showed or designed um, fits in very well within the historic urban fabric. And the restoration work, which she didn't show as much, is also amazingly well done to an ex excellent standard. The other thing, um, and maybe this is the last thing I'll say, is that cities evolve and change. And this project recognizes that, that it's not only about initiating good projects, but it's also about putting in place a mechanism that makes sure that change is managed and that um, you don't suffocate and stifle people, but on the other hand, you don't destroy what is valuable. And the, the building controls process is a very well thought out one. Um, it takes into account what is important and what ought to be preserved and the forms and the typology and the urban fabric. But at the same time, it's not too prescriptive. So it doesn't prevent people from doing new things or from making change and from living, basically. Um, and I think the outcome is that it has modern things and it's, it has new things and you can see intervention. But it's not a sterile project. It's not a project that looks as if if you move a chair in the wrong di direction, suddenly uh, the whole thing collapses. It's, it's a dynamic initiative. Um, and I think... When I went to review it, what I came away with is I hope other people see this project and learn from it and are inspired by it because um, it's multifaceted and it has many great lessons to learn, to teach. Many thanks, Saif. Uh, later, we're going to have, during the um, panel discussion, time to talk about it, especially this project can be inspiring for now all the problems which are in Karachi and that all the new, uh, uh, some of the older part of Karachi has been the ideas of having projects to be re renovated. I think this will be a very good model. Now we're going to go, you know, we have to go a little bit faster. I'm going to go to the next project, which is the, uh, the public spaces in Tataristan. Now, that, I was very lucky to go to Tataristan, uh, which a lot of people don't know where it is. When you talk about Tataristan, people just think about many other places, not knowing that this is one of the major cities of the Russian Federation. It has been historically uh, the uh, 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 um, republics, historically the Kazan, the city of Kazan, which is the farthest northern east place that which has been became Muslim city of Bulgar. And it is a combination of the people who live there are the different ethnic groups and different cultures and different uh, faiths all living together peacefully for such a long time. Um, here we have coming with another phenomena, which is my dear friend Natalia Fishman Bekmagmova. And she is uh, exceptional because she can be a role model for a lot of these people now looking at the um, the screen. I don't know how she can, she can compete with her because after her studies at the age of 19, she started working. And the age of 19, she became the advisor to the, the, the culture director of the city of Moscow. And then she worked there. She was the, at this, uh, the, for the architects is known the Strelka Institute for 
media and architecture and design. She was working there on older education programs and worked on the Gorky Park and the other parks. And she was also at the same time going to Germany and studying in Germany and studying in different places. And that's where, with the, all the things she's done, the president of Tatarstan went to Moscow and asked her to join uh, him in a project in Tatarstan. The some th over 300 or 400, I don't know how many parks in different cities of Tatarstan are the brainchild of Natalia. Natalia, I'm not going to take the, anything from you. Just go ahead, please, and make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Farouk, for the introduction. First of all, I wanted to apologize for the setting I'm in. I got stuck in St. Petersburg because of my husband's birthday. So I have to be in a cafe. I beg your pardon. Second of all, I wanted to express enormous gratitude. And this is not a formal thing to say because I've been horribly missing belonging to the Agahan Architecture Award uh, community. It's such an incredible thing to be part of a community and also to be recognized by people worldwide because you know you work in some you know like small unimpressive village somewhere on the you know edge of Tatarstan and then then comes Faroq and then come comes Anna and then come all those incredible people who are online with us now and you you understand and you realize that you're doing something really globally important and this is the greatest gift uh, anyone has ever given me I'm I'm extremely great, grateful for Och and I'm grateful to all of you I'll try to be quick uh, although I cannot guarantee it uh, is is my uh, presentation visible now yes Good. Um, so, uh, thing is, we've been working for the last five years with the most unbelievable president of Tatarstan, Mr. Rustam Minikhanov. Actually, Farouk, it's not only you who doesn't know how many spaces exactly there are. Um, there are 300, I, I, I'm also in doubt sometimes, it's 396 spaces that already have been created and I'm going to show you some of them and 62 more public spaces are right now under construction. Um, we are working all across the Republic, Republic of Tatarstan. Uh, there are 45 municipalities uh, which have the aerial centers where we started from and then we are moving on further to the smallest villages spreading this quality of life uh, standard. Um, what is important to understand about us as a team um, is that we're trying to be as multidisciplinary as possible, which is not a typical approach for uh, Russian red tape, you know. Um, and the key thing that we're always trying to explain to our partners from all across Russia, because we have now become the educational centers where all the regions um, of Russia are sending uh, professionals to study. What we're always telling them is that um, we have to recognize um, local activists to be as important as the ministries. We have to recognize the local producers to be as important as any uh, partner in the city, uh, government. So it's it's extremely important to be really multidisciplinary and to have this um, this respect for all different um, partners in this process. Um, this is our team. In the center, it's, it's uh, Mr. Minihanov, the president of Tatarstan. Uh, to the right is the mayor of Kazan, our capital, Mr. Ilsur Machin. And to the left is uh, um, Karina, one of the architects who have um, received this incredible opportunity to uh, have a portfolio of dozens of uh, realized projects at the age of under 30 years old. And I think that this is one of the important uh, opportunities we're given. And this is why we are able to attract the best of the young professionals. So um, this is the first principle we're following. Uh, when I came to Kazan from Moscow, I realized that um, um, that there is hardly uh, a team of architects I would commission uh, to create a public space. Thing is that in the later Soviet Union, 
starting from, uh, I'd say, mid-70s, there were no new public spaces constructed. And all the knowledge, all the people in the former Soviet Union countries have about it is more or less theoretical. Um, we started the public spaces renovation process in Moscow in 2011 with my previous boss, Mr. Sergei Kapkov, the Minister of Culture of Moscow, as Farouk has said. And we had, working in Moscow with the Moscow money, Moscow budgets and, and, and Moscow opportunities, we could commission the greatest architects we had in Russia. It, it cost a lot of money, but we could afford it. Now, when I came to Kazan and I turned to them to ask them to help me, I was extremely young and I was not prepared for, for, for this job and, uh, and the circumstances I'm going to be in. So I came to one of those leading uh, Moscow architecture companies who has created uh, the incredible project of Gorky Park renovation in Moscow. And I said, Oleg, please help me. I've just moved to Kazan and they've asked me to renovate the central first historic park garden of Kazan. It's the Black Lake Garden please, please uh, do come and make a project. He said, okay, Natalia, no problem. It's gonna, for you, it's gonna cost 12 million rubles. I said, Oleg, but you know, I, I, I need a discount. I've given you so many projects while you were, uh, while we were working in Moscow. Please, please make it cheaper. He said, okay, we're friends. We've done so many incredible things. It's gonna be 6 million rubles. I was super proud. I went to the minister of construction of Tatarstan and I said, Eric, I've just, you know, had any an incredible, incredible negotiations. I've commissioned the best of, you know, the creme de la creme of Russian architecture to make a, a project for us for six million. And he looked at me and said, "You know what, Natalia? I've got thirty million for one hundred twenty projects, so it's not going to work." I was stunned, really. So this is when uh, we realized we need to create a local team and a new professional community of architects in Kazan. And we began by, uh, by bringing back to Tatarstan the young, talented people who have moved out from there, moved to Moscow, to St. Petersburg, moved abroad, uh, promising that they would have the opportunity to uh, realize their projects, promising that they will get a new, a lot of new experience, and the and, and also just giving them the opportunity to work for for motherland. And they Tatars really have a very strong feeling to to towards their their own uh, own land. So they came back. Uh, it's a team uh, of people, all of them under thirty five. It just happened so. It's it's you know there was uh, no segregation. It's, it just happened so. Uh, many of them uh, were students when they joined the team and they joined to help uh, as, an in, as on an internship. And then they stayed and they have evolved to architects who are now, which is funny, Farouk, you didn't know that, who are now working in Nizhny Novgorod, which is uh, one of the largest cities in uh, Russia, for Vladivostok, which is, you know, the, the, the far, far east of, of Russia. So um, they are now of Bashkortostan, which is a neighboring republic, also Muslim predominantly. Uh, so now it's it's an incredible process when those young people evolving from our team are, are, are ruling this whole architectural process all across Russia. Uh, what we did to educate them is a very interesting process. We brought uh, professionals, uh, experienced architects from Russia, uh, from Moscow, for two to three weeks. And we made workshops where uh, we brought, made, you know, distributed people into teams of two, uh, of eight to ten people. And they worked um, under the curation of the experienced architects uh, on a certain project. And they got a lot of skills and um, a lot of experience they would have been earning for years from those leaders. And then it, it really, every time we had such a workshop, we had them five times. It really, you know, uh, gave a lot, of, uh, a lot of input into the process of um, uh, how they created projects and how they, um, how they perceived the space. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of information uh, now because I realize I'm, I'm short of time. Um, another important thing about working with the people is uh, formating the directorate for parks and formating the managerial team. And I'm going to show you uh, later how, how it functions. Uh, extremely important point, maybe uh, Anna will later comment on that, is developing local manufacturing because this is something that helps uh, transform all the money we invest in this process uh, into local economy and also develops a lot of local skills like this incredible uh, 
street lightning furniture was created in the village of Muslumova, which is eight and a half thousand people. Uh, and they produce, though they, they designed it themselves, they produce it themselves, and they sell it all across Russia themselves uh, because uh, our project uh, empowered them to, to, do, to be creative and to get the funding to be able to realize it. And then, then it, it just started working. Um, the most important principle that, that uh, we're profiting is uh, participatory design. Um, it all started with a very sad story. This willow tree was growing in one of the Kazan parks. When I just arrived to Kazan, like three weeks since, since I stepped in, and the reconstruction started, and one of the workers, because the quality of, of contractors is extremely important to the final outcome, and as a state, it's not easy to control it, especially as a very regulated state uh, Russia is. So this willow tree was cut down, and uh, we ended up in a you know tragic uh, tragic um, discussion with uh, with the uh, citizens. So as the outcome of this process, we uh, ended up creating a manual of to, to uh, uh, leading participatory design process. So we have a very strict uh, and sp specific procedure of how we make citizens our actual clients so for me the client is not the state for me the client is the citizen and we have created the mechanism that really makes the citizen the client because they come to certain meetings and they we, we give them a map of the territory we give them stickers with different functions we ask them to work in groups and to create a um a functional task for the architect and then the architect comes after this meeting in a month and a half and presents the project and those people who are now the clients have to approve or not approve sometimes we changed the project nine times until uh, everyone was happy with it uh, also we not just discuss with uh, general audiences we work with uh, specific communities like we have a large community of um, uh, people who are into extreme sports and we create facilities for them and actually tomorrow we're launching the largest extreme park in russia i'm going to show you the pictures uh, at the end of the presentation uh, i'm going to skip a lot of the information because otherwise it's going to take too long and i'm going to move uh, to the pictures of uh, the projects, just for you to get an idea, because I think that the time is too short to really tell a lot. This is um, a village of three and a half thousand people population. We have created an embankment that connects the two banks, because when in spring the water level rises, the two banks are uh, not non accessible. It's hard to cross, and it's hard for children to get to school. Uh, and the hospital is on, on one of the sides of the river. So we created this embankment. The, the, the head of the, the mayor of this territory wanted to put a lot of concrete, uh, as you could imagine, on the shores. Um, we stopped him from that. We made it very ecological. And, and we still uh, have, with this higher embankment, we have um, created the uh, opportunity to cross and to be connected. Uh, this is the village of Muslimova I love so much. We have an embankment which is five kilometers long. Um, maybe Anna will comment on that because she's, she's been there. It's, it's, it's a very specific experience. Um, this is a, a, a river front we've made uh, where the great Russian rivers Volga and Kama merge. And it's 42 kilometers wide, this place, uh, where you can see no other bank. You feel like you're really at the sea. So we call it the Kama Sea, and uh, it's 40 minutes drive from Kazan. It's 15,000 people per day in summer. And it totally changed the economy of the territory because for a, a place which has 10,000 inhabitants, less than 10,000 inhabitants, having 15,000 people every day uh, is a huge uh, change to, to how it functions. So all the houses on the front line were sold turned into hostels, into cafes, into small shops, uh, and, and, and people are working in, in the services industry now, and, and uh, it's, it's a great 
help for the place. Um, it's really, really, really a lot of places like this park. Um, I just make one small quick comment. It was also the, the, the mayor of this place also wanted to put a lot of concrete, but to a different place. We found it this we found the springs in the field. We dug out the land, we created this uh, incredible pond, and all of this, all of this together with the street furniture uh, and all the construction works cost us five hundred US five hundred thousand US dollars. So it's just for you to understand how extremely cheap we make all of it. This is the central square in the city of Bavli, which is 20,000 people. I don't come from Tatarstan originally, and I have to say uh, that uh, the central square of my mother, of my hometown, which is uh, a little bit more than 1 million inhabitants, doesn't have a square like the, the central square, like the city of Bavli with 20,000 people has. This is Bugulma. This is the uh, beach we've made in the city of Almetyevsk. Uh, uh, the planetarium in one of the uh, parks in Almetyevsk, the beach uh, in the Zelenadolsk. This is a huge park we've created in the city of Nizhnikamsk. I'm really going to go very quickly now, Farok, because I, you, look, you, you look strict, actually. Um, also, this is the central embankment of Nizhnikamsk and the beach we've added on. This is the embankment of uh, the riverfront of, uh, in Nabrezhne Chelny the second largest city. Actually, for this one, you've not seen, it was not finished. This is the Azatlik Square in Nabrezhne Chelny, the Freedom Square, Independence Square. And we're very proud of this one. Uh, it has a long story to tell, but I cannot uh, elaborate really. Uh, again, Kazan, we're moving on to Kazan, a lot of, actually, I was speaking to the president of Russia standing here uh, in this uh, place yesterday telling him about uh, protecting the rights of uh, activists who are standing up against unlawful and um, unreasonable um, undertakes, undertakings in city development. So this is another incredible park in uh, Kazan, which was supposed to be a huge road, but we managed to protect it together you, together with the activists. The Black Lake Park, I mentioned, the oldest park in Kazan, the White Flowers Boulevard, the one that came in place instead of a huge parking lot. All of this land was a huge parking lot. Then another project which is uh, extremely important to us and which was not finished by the moment we uh, worked with the Aga Hanna Board for Architecture, this is the ecological rehabilitation of the Swan Lakes uh, ecosystem. Um, there this is a system of uh, formerly four lakes with uh, the, uh, with this, with the, with, with the mirror of the lake, with the water uh, square of 40 hectares, which was gone, which disappeared, dried out, and we restored three of them with the water surface of more than 20 hectares now. And this is a huge, largest ecological rehabilitation project of a water system in Russia. This is what it looks like now, very popular among the citizens of Kazan. And um, this is our beloved uh, Kaban Lake system, um, the project that came into living after, as a result of an international competition won by the great uh, Dr. Kon Jang Yu from Turinscape. Uh, it's it's a, an incredible space we've created in the center of the city. Uh, this is the before and after pictures, some of them. Uh, and actually looks like I have to be like really quick. This is what we're launching tomorrow, Farokh. This is the extreme park created by sportsmen for sportsmen. This is uh, uh, the, the concept because they have not finished yet, but tomorrow I could send you the pictures of what it looks like in actual life. So we are creating this large extreme park because now extreme sports have become part of the Olympic program, one of the Olympic sports. And we really need to create the um, place where people could get prepared for all of this, um, could, be, could, could, could go through training. So we are creating the open uh, extreme park and also we're right now constructing um, a, a, a 
roofed extreme park, uh, which would give them the opportunity to train all the year round. So I bet in some four, five, six years, you're going to have a lot of Olympic champions coming from Russia, Tatarstan and Kazan. I wanted to thank you again so much because it's not just about the isolation we have all been experiencing in the in the past months, but the isolation from this incredible community was was specifically painful. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, well, uh, for those of, of you who are sitting in Karachi, I just have to mention one thing. You saw all the pictures that uh, Natalia had chosen, but she did not choose what it, these, all these places look six months a year, which is all white under snow and nobody can go out. It is, but it, it's incredible because these spaces also work during the winter. And that's the most important thing about them. Uh, Anna, if you can go very quickly, with some comments so we can have a time for some uh, panel discussions. Uh, yes, thank you very much, um, Natalia, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. And um, it was really a great privilege to, to be the reviewer for this project. Um, I was fortunate to visit uh, many of the projects, of course, not, uh, not all of them. And, uh, uh, and to see the impact um, that this has had on the spaces, on the landscapes and on the people. And as Natalia said, you know, um, what she did was to make the citizen, you know, the client of the project. And I remember her saying, you know, we're not here to realize, you know, the dreams of the architects, but really, um, you know, to design um, for the citizens. And uh, this reminded me of a quote by the great uh, urbanist uh, author, Jane Jacobs in 1961. And she said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and when they are created by everybody. And it's really wonderful to see um, that in this, this program, and um, unfortunately, you know, there was a willow that was sacrificed for this. Um, but but the effect and the impact has been wide. And I wanted to mention and underscore that the impact is not only in uh, Tatarstan, but also now that uh, participative planning for public spaces has actually become a regulation in the whole of Russia. So now this, 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 um, this Tatarstan model is being um, now applied in the whole of Russia, this participative planning. So it really has an impact at the uh, national uh, level of uh, Russia, so um, so obviously one of the you know one of the impressive things is the scale of the work that Natalia and all her team has done in the whole of Tatarstan and how it affects really different types of urban settlements as you've seen in uh, the presentations. Um, and, and this is uh, really important, um, not just uh, obviously for the citizens and societies, but it also makes me think of. Um, the whole problem of urban, of uh, rural migration. Um, just at the moment, there is a big exhibition uh, called Countryside of the Future uh, in the Guggenheim by Rem Kuhlhaas, really looking at what is 98% of the Earth's uh, surface, which is not by cities. We always say, you know, um, we will be an urbanized, or we will all be living in cities in the future. And one of the ideas behind this is also saying that we have to create good public space in every type of settlement, from a small village, agricultural village, to um, even a village like Muslimova, which she showed where there is some manufacturing, but which has now been transformed into also a new industry of manufacturing for public spaces. And also in um, renovating the public spaces of the industrial cities, which were built in the 1960s with public spaces, but which, were, which really had to be redesigned. And then to go to the scales of these large lakes and ecology, all these ecological projects where we, we're sort of remediating and re, restoring ecologies. Um, the Caban Lakes is also a fantastic project where they're using the reed beds to clean the water of the Caban Lakes. And hopefully soon, you know, people will be able to swim in these lakes. And it's also very educational because people can actually see, um, uh, you know, that this ecological process happening. And I remember talking to the dendrologist a dendrologist who was telling me this project is like a social bomb 
you know, because people are really interested in their learning and they're so um, they're so enthusiastic about about this this functional landscape. So it's not just, of course, the, the landscapes have many different functions um, going, as she showed, you know, from sports to to culture. Um, as Farouk mentioned, you know, there's 50 percent of, of Muslim uh, and Tatars and there are very important festivals which bring together all the different cultures. So these public spaces are also where this culture um, can be can be expressed. Um, as you also mentioned, Farouk, uh, the winter and uh, the programming is very important because it's not only the designing uh, and also the programming. So these spaces are also programmed in the winter and they're also quite beautiful. Um, and we understand why there's so much color used. I visited actually in the winter when it was white and Tatastan is in the winter is very black and white. So, so then the color becomes even more important and the lighting and, um, and there are concerts in, in the middle of winter by you know things we might not imagine. Um, but the whole programming is both winter and summer. So they're really used um, all, um, all the year round. Um, so as Natalia did also underscore, is is um, when when we talk about this urban rural migration, is these industries, the landscape industries, uh, the architects, it's also keeping um, the young people in the rural communities. It's saying, how do we make them attractive as big cities so that we can keep not only the architects in the big cities, but also the youth to make them proud of their villages, their towns, their cities, um, because this, this new public space actually creates a new urban identity for all these settlements. And it means that the youth also not only have new industries um, or, or, and new activities that they can get engaged in, but they also have an identity, an urban identity um, that, that, that they're proud of. Um, uh, what else can I say? Also, um, I'd like to just mention the fact that uh, the Aga Khan Award was held in Kazan, but also um, then um, that the president and Natalia hosted the World Urban Parks Forum. And uh, there we saw actually people coming, not from also from all over the world specialists, but also from all around uh, Russia. And you could see really these workshops where they were really learning about this Tatarstan model of uh, participation. And uh, with Natalia, they also have created a Eurasian um, uh, chapter of the World Urban Park. So this is also another way that maybe this model can be sort of disseminated and applied in other areas in, in the Eurasian um, uh, sort of um, geographical context. Um, so that's another sort of future impact. And then I maybe wanted just to talk about another future project, that an evolution at an, a very different scale of this project is the Kazanka River project, which I, um, I, I interviewed some people working on that. And it's actually at the scale of the river. And they're using this participative process at the scale of this whole river and riverbed. And so it, it has, you know, industrial sites, it's got ecological sites, and they, they're inviting people to come and participate in the future uh, uh, vision of this huge public space of blue green infrastructure through the participative process. So this is sort of, uh, uh, let's say another scale of, uh, of the project, how it's um, how it's evolving uh, in in the future, and of course I could say lots more uh, fantastic things about okay. the project, <laughs> um, but I will stop here um, because I know that there are other. Thanks. No, because uh, I mean, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, both of the projects are so large, and they've got so many. Uh, um, um, ideas and there's so many achievements it's not one achievement it's more that each of them needs a proper presentation a proper discussion and what you discuss discuss uh, Anna goes a lot on uh, what is your specialty as uh, Anna uh, Grifting I mean I've been she's been a reviewer for uh, the Alcon Award and she's been also working with me on the education program of the Alcon Award for Architecture and Projects she's a uh, she's been a professor of architecture in Qatar and in Geneva and she's been she's a Harvard graduate and uh, but she has got she mentioned about she was very keen on talking about the the concerts that's happening in Kazan because she's also a musician and she was just before this telling us that she's also performed in Pakistan so you have to ask her to come back to Pakistan and perform uh, now I would, I would like you to have a, uh, I have to go quickly through uh, we don't have that much time unfortunately but we have I would like to the two people to be uh, join me in the conversation uh, a representative of the steering committee, Francesco Bandarin, and uh, a representative of the 
um, not a representative, a member, each of them are members of the master degree. Mona Fawaz, who she is a professor of architecture in uh, American University in Beirut, and um, she has been on the jury. So it was, you have been looking at these, both of these projects and you've seen in the context. And what was important, I mean, because you had a general message that you would like to um, explain about the, all the projects, together, especially like these two. At the same time, uh, Francesco Bandarin, who's a member of our steering committee, and Francesco has been the um, deputy di uh, uh, director general of UNESCO for many years, and she's, he is also very familiar with both projects because uh, in putting uh, Moharak on the heritage list, also being to Kazan, and he has written a book on, uh, on Bulgar and Kazan uh, for the award ceremony. So he knows both of them quite well. And Francesco is a member of our steering committee. He's an architect uh, uh, and uh, being the head of the heritage to, uh, at UNESCO, he knows all the heritage sites. So he can put this into context. And I would like you to, to put these two projects into a larger context, which how it works internationally compared to the other ones. And also how it, uh, Mona, you are very keen on that. How people live, what is the, what it means, pr big project. What's the meaning of these projects to people? Yes, uh, thank you, Farah, for uh, this question, and uh, thank you for including me in the discussion. It was really wonderful to see again those projects and remember uh, the wonderful uh, contributions they really make to the work of architecture. I uh, vividly recall the debates in the jury uh, and the appreciation for the centrality of this notion of public uh, that appears in both of the project. Recognizing urbanization and the making of public space really much less as a finished product than as a process that can only be made through uh, processes of governance that both include states and people in inclusive way. As uh, many of you know, uh, often when we think of public space, there's this notion that it's something which is finished, which is locked into a certain geometry. And I think both interventions succeed very nicely in making us think that a public space is something which is shared, always in the making, as is urbanization, and that for it to be possible, it has to really involve multiple actors and to become a living space for uh, its users. So in a time where we're, uh, I think with the current COVID crisis and the extent to which cities that have managed to keep an infrastructure of good public space have succeeded in containing the pandemic and offering the residents a much uh, better life than those who haven't. We see these projects even uh, shining further in this contribution to the public. But I think that to, to us, what was really important is that both of them also built on a notion of collective history and shared identity that did not stay fixed in a certain place, but actually involved users and including professionals of the built environment, but also residents of the city in, in a way that they could reinvent uh, the story of the cities where they are and engage new publics in this uh, process of creating a new kind of public space, each adapted to the way in which it, in the place in which it is, and hence, uh, move a fixed understanding or imagination of public space into more of an integrative uh, notion that includes an uh, ecological dimension to it, but also social and uh, economic uh, elements into it. And finally, I think a big nod to the public in both cases, public actors really in this time uh, being interested in investing in the public being interested in creating this infrastructure of shared spaces, which we've, uh, we live in a time where sadly more and more we hear about pops or publicly, privately owned public spaces, places where um, public agencies, whether they are the municipality or local governments or central governments are uh, delegating to uh, the private actors, the responsibility of creating those publics. So recognizing the importance for public agencies specifically to create those shared spaces and to create them in ways that empower their users was a very important uh, aspect of their success. Um, they did this, and that's really my final thing because I'm very conscious of time, but they really did this with also paying a lot of attention to architecture, not creating spaces that uh, 
are where you neglect this because you care for process. So they create ultimately spaces that have a unique architecture quality that innovate in the in in the architecture language while at the same time also serving a multitude of users. So that's really in a nutshell some of the things we uh, we remembered. And of course, I'm not doing justice to these great projects. Jessica? Well, thank you very much. Hello to everybody, to Mona and all the colleagues. But first of all, um, let me say one thing, you know, the, the Aga Award for Architecture is uh, 40 years old, 41, well, last year was 40, 40, 40 years old. And the World Heritage Convention is the same time, same period, because in fact, the first inscription was in 78. So, you know, there, these are two parallel stories that we have to look at. Uh, in a way, it's very interesting also to see how they crisscross, because they, this is a, there are cases, you know, like the Muharak is a case of crisscross, and how, in fact, this, uh, uh, they, they're mutually you know, influenced and uh, fertilized, I would say. Um, if we look at the long range of the Aga Khan Award, we can see that urban revitalization uh, around heritage has always been you know a key a key element a key context uh, of reference for the award uh, even before the award was informalized uh, you had you know the city busaid the project in in early 70s uh, kairuan uh, and then all all along the uh, evolution of the of the award which farouk has you now steered for 30 years now uh, you had uh, you know Project of Sanaa, uh, Shibam was uh, also awarded Nicosia, lately Birzeit, you know, about a few years ago. So I think, you know, it's a constant thing. And so we have to see Muharak as part of this long, long uh, strategy of, uh, you know, trying to bring back heritage to the community, especially in regions and contexts where they were not very well uh, placed and were not well maintained. I mean, the Gulf countries have rediscovered this uh, heritage quite recently because the wave of modernity has in a way erased a lot of this of this uh, heritage i think we are lucky that uh, maharak was uh, uh, taken care of by our friend uh, sheikh kamai uh, who was minister of culture and she's you know not only uh, she did this uh, fantastic uh, promoted this fantastic role but also she created you know in, in bahrain a, a unesco uh, center for, for training and mobile heritage so we worked a lot uh, together on that um, because it shows it's an example uh, it's a case study for many, many countries in, in, in the region that now discover that they do actually have, you know, important heritage places that deserve being uh, protected and preserved and even uh, regenerated in their, you know, in the, and put back in the life of the community, uh, except that they couldn't see them. So I think that the, what has been done there, it's very interesting from architectural point of view, from a heritage preservation point of view. Uh, but you know what's really very important is the message that is sent, and this message, believe me, is heard because you know now you know we see even uh, in Saudi Arabia there's a lot of attention. You know the site of Diria, for instance, now being regenerated. Uh, Jeddah, Jeddah was inscribed in the World Heritage List. I mean, can you believe it? <laughs> Many people don't even think that there is an old the jet there, well, there is. Um, now, it's true that this also belongs to the uh, DNA of the Al Khan. If you look at the other project, for instance, that the uh, cities uh, program, you, know, you can see that there is, a, I mean, of course, you cannot award yourself, Farouk, uh, you cannot, Aga Khan cannot award yourself, but some of the best projects in urban revitalization are done by the Aga Khan Trust itself. I mean, is there anything more impressive than the Al Azhar Park in uh, Cairo and the Darab al, uh, al Ahmar? A village nearby, or or even more, the Nizamuddin intervention in Delhi next to the Humayun. I mean, I think I think it's very clear that there is a, you know, a, a, an interest, uh, uh, you know, a, and a very very strong message that comes not only through the award but also to the overall activity of the Al Khan. So I think it's so important as a message as a kind of a direction that you know i would like to stop here because you know, it's, it's, it's very clear that, that this has been you know not only captured by the award but also by the world heritage uh, convention now the other project the public space i think it's also also i mean <laughs> i mean the other hand one of the works, uh, the so extraordinary works of the art has been all the gardens. You know, of course, again, you cannot award yourself, but <laughs> lots of gardens around the world that you know carry this uh, message. You know, that in fact you you do care about public spaces because public spaces is where you know social life is possible. So through the award, I think you've done quite a lot, even perhaps even more than on revitalization. You've got a lot of valorization, and you've valued 
the public space as you know a place important for the life of the community. Um, a few years ago, uh, you gave a prize and award to the Tabiat Bridge uh, in uh, in Iran. This is a bridge becomes like a public space, an amazing uh, project. Uh, but you know, even before uh, you know, a lot of Parks for for children in, in Cairo, you know, the in Beirut. You know you have it, and you know the culmination of this strategy was the super killing work uh, that was done in Copenhagen. It was you know awarded a, uh, in the previous cycle. You know it's 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 a it's an urban park um, that where in fact what's uh, but and again it's not just the architecture because if it was only the architecture maybe there. Are, you know, there are other things that are the other. It's, it's actually the social impact of it. You know, the, the great social impact of it. I think nothing compares, of course, to the Tatarstan program because that's a you know a statewide program with hundreds of parks and so on. But we are in that line, in that direction. You know, quality of urban space is a, an effector of urban cohesion, of urban well-being, and uh, human well-being. And it's extremely important to invest in that. I think the message that comes from from the Tatarstan. That, you, that has been awarded is uh, you know it's been captured quite quite clearly by the Russian uh, you know this has become like a national program now so it's it's a model that you know will certainly reverberate in Russia and beyond because it is really what people expect from you know from their governments and from their even from their architects you know something that perhaps sometimes is very simple uh, but it opens up quality of life for for the people and when it's done with the participation of the people it then becomes a, co a collective value. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Um, unfortunately, we are always running out of time and the discussions are so interesting having all these discussions. I'm going to just, there, uh, there's uh, many questions, uh, which I'm, I don't think we can have time to go through all of the questions, but uh, let me just go through a couple of them, which has come, I mean, this is almost generic. The first is for Muharraq. Um, the, the, the questions are, the first questions, of course, you can uh, see this is the size of the population comprises people who come from different parts of the world, including South Asia. How do this urban design intervention relate to the aspiration and needs for present day social milieu, which is what you explained, Nora, and especially Mohara. And I, th I mean, I would not going to answer instead of you, but this whole thing that you've got the public spaces is where a lot of these people who are living in one room, they, they rent a room, they're many of them, they live in the same room. These public spaces that you've created has given them a space to breathe in the city and that in the, in the neighborhoods. Can you just go a little bit further and, and explain that? Yeah. I mean that was the, the really beautiful thing of these squares, you know, when we implemented and we opened them, very soon they became like kind of urban living rooms, you know, public living rooms. They were immediately appropriated um, by many different people living in the city for different needs. And that was also one of the reasons why it was important for us that these spaces were not, uh, had an openness to them in their programming, you know, that they were not um, pre-programmed in a sense that they would dictate behavior because the idea was really that they should fill in the gaps of all the things that were missing in the city in, in 50 years of, uh, you know, lack of in investment in the city and upgrade of the infrastructure uh, and so on. But, you know, we often get asked this question um, about the people living in Muharraq and, you know, you know, there's a large population uh, from South Asia. There's also a lot of people from, from Egypt, from Yemen. It's a very mixed city and how we incorporate this in the design of the city. And I think, you know, in the end, the most important thing is that public space needs to, needs to serve everyone. I mean, we don't, you know, start designing public space for a a, a certain segment of the population. I think that successful public spaces are successful because they're able to, to absorb all the different actors of the city and all these different actors in the city are able to find their space and their, you know, their, their own living of these spaces. Yeah, that, and, um, the, another question on, the, on Muharraq was that um, we we're saying that how does the design contribute to in, invigorate identity? Um, how did local community react, workers react uh, to this project? Um, it is interesting what you were saying because uh, a lot of people have moved, a lot of people have come back, but the, generally the reaction of the, uh, of the um, 
citizens, the people who are living there, with all these new elements that you've brought in? Because one of the brave things which has been happening in Muharraf is that you are not shy of having very contemporary buildings which will fit into the context in the old Muharraf. You know, it's a funny thing because someone asked us this question uh, a few months ago and then I thought about it a bit more in detail. And the really, you know, surprising and specific thing about Muharraq is that we got a lot more resistance towards the rehabilitation and conservation of the old buildings than we did uh, towards the introduction of very contemporary architecture. I think, you know, Francesco referred to this a bit, but modernization here arrived, you know, with with so much energy, let's say. And, you know, there is really an appreciation for newness and, uh, you know, contemporary expressions in this part of the world. And uh, so we really had hardly any opposition, you know, even the Dar building, which is a really strong architecture statement in the middle of the historic city. You know, people were really, were, were excited about it. The most resistance we had and the most resistance Sheikh Hamay had at the start of this project was people were asking her, why are you throwing money into old buildings that, you know, will, will be demolished in, in a few years' time? Why are you wasting government money on rehabilitating these structures? And that really was the challenge of the project, um, uh, you know, really trying to un make people understand that we could breathe new life to these buildings and that really they were really central to a national identity and that they were something that needed to be preserved. And uh, just I just add one thing because they were discussing about the identity and also the new new functions that you brought in. I mean, one of the in, most in, is in, interesting things at the CERN, which is this uh, center in Geneva, which they're working on uh, physics and I mean, it's the most advanced. They have now a center in one of the buildings in Muharraf, and they're doing that. I mean, that is, that is very inspiring to have these new functions, how it can house new functions, bringing new uh, life back to the uh, to the area. Um, I've got also two questions from, uh, from, from Natalia. And the first says that, how are the local specificities of each public space taken into account in the context of the larger scale projects? And the other, pro the other question is that, how, how can, can you tell us a bit about your process of working with the expectations of both client government and local users? Because this is, I think, one of the areas that a lot of architects, they don't know how to deal with the two. On one hand, they're the users, and on the other hand, they've got the government authorities. The meaning of the authority in different countries is, is different. I mean, you have to listen, how much you have to listen to them. How can, can you challenge them, convince them what you can do? And you have been going through all these things as well. So. I'll go, I'll go with the rest of it later. There are so many questions. Thank you so much. The questions you've selected are brilliant. And thank you uh, to all of those who are still with us. Um, speaking of how we take uh, the local speci specific, well, how, do I, how do I even say it in, in English? Uh, specific uh, traits, I don't know. Uh, look, there are uh, different types of those. Uh, first of all, you really have to uh, realize the um, scale of the place you're working for because it means that the public space is going to have a totally different role in the life of the territory and um, a meaning, a different meaning and, and also the way you would use this, the people would be using the space can also be very different. Uh, for instance, um, there was a, a settlement uh, called, a historic settlement called Kukmer uh, and once we uh, opened up an embankment there, the next day uh, there was a group of active uh, citizens who came uh, to the uh, head of the territory and said, look, um, Dmitry, we are now going to apply for the status of a city because we now have an embankment, which is the most shocking thing for them that the lights did not go off at night because this was the only light space in the night and they walked there the whole night people in this settlement of uh, 18,000 inhabitants and the next day they said we are a city now please go talk to the president of Tatarstan we are applying to the status of the city so it's really important to understand the role of the place also of course it's also it's also extremely important to understand the uh, ecosystem and the climate, because even within Tatarstan we have uh, very different climates, and uh, the time 
when the snow melts, is, is th there is a three weeks difference between Kazan and, for instance, Bugulma, or some even further 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 away cities from the capital. So it's it's something also to take into consideration because when we work there, the snow falls earlier and melts down later it means the winter is even longer for them so when we work with them we invest much more into winter infrastructure actually than into summer infrastructure um, also uh, of course the extent to which your design could be brave and innovative is slightly different uh, because what you can do in kazan could be slightly shocking for a small village but actually, what we have uh, found out is we've made a lot of um, uh, so, uh, social studies uh, to evaluate, to, to, to uh, understand how people um, take, like how they perceive the job we're doing, if they're happy with it or not, how it changes their everyday practices. And um, really, um, it's incredibly important for the people here in Russia just to see something new and they are even ready to uh to um, for, for something really brave and 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 and, uh, and modern it's just extremely important for them to feel that, that the things are new because they are so they have they're carrying this trauma of of the um times of the dissolution of the soviet union of the early years of russia when there was no money at all so just give us something new is the key message and um, and uh, well i could i could really tell you so much about it so i need to stop now uh, answering the first question and the second one was about for career me no it was about the this uh the how you're going the the expectation of the both the okay. client and the government yeah, yeah, yeah. and the youth yeah, yeah, yeah. uh now uh because i'm the government i'm not uh, uh, an architect. I'm, a I'm, I'm. I am the government. It's it's something that is easier to manage in this uh, in this uh, case because formally I am the client for the architects. Um, if um, I'm trying to be as uh, honest as possible, I would say that the key thing to manage is to persuade the government. In my case, this is the president of Tatarstan, who is a bright person and easy to convince that they don't need to have an, um, an idea of what it should be like. They don't need to make comments according to their taste or perception of what life should be like. They need to uh, commission a professional and to trust him. And I think that um, this is manageable. Uh, this this part of convincing, because uh, if you if you can demonstrate if you can prove that your approach is a success, it becomes really quite easy because you just tell the people you trust me and I solve your problem. So this 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 works. Uh, speaking of the expectations of the community of the citizens, I know it was not in the question, but I think that this is the most important thing to discuss. Um, also, my experience says, it, I, I, um, I was very ill-perceived in the first two and a half, three years. There was, um, because I was too young and uh, I was not coming from Tatarstan originally. And also I am Jewish, which is a, a strong thing for people in Tatarstan. Uh, they're very tolerant, but it's just, it's what, it was really hard to explain why you should hire a 24-year-old Jewish girl from Moscow to work in Tatarstan. Don't you have professionals uh, locally? So um, I had a lot of uh, problems with the media at first. Um, and also a lot of criticism because of the, of the willow tree we showed. I, didn't, I was not responsible for it being cut down, but obviously I had to take responsibility in order to make the people trust me later on. Uh, so... It is extremely important to be very honest, even to, to demonstrate the limitations of your capability uh, and to not be afraid to talk 
uh, in any situation, even if this situation is uh, not complementary to you. Uh, and I think that it only happened, it only started going well after three years of uh, work, after three years of uh, keeping every word uh, promise. And um, the meetings that we had at first, which were full of uh, um, skepticism, turned into a totally different configuration because when you come to a meeting to a group of people like 200, 300, 400 people, and the first thing you say, please raise your hands those who have been to the Gorkins Khometyevsky forest, like three quarters of them raise their hands if it's in Kazan or those who have been to the Gabdulatukai embankment in Nabirezhne Chilni or in every, in every other, other city. And you then ask, do you like it? And then most of them really do say yes. And then you say, this is going to be the same team. We're not going to harm your beloved park. We're not going to do anything wrong. And we are going to listen to you as we listen to you in that case. This is the moment when it all changes and when, when the skepticism goes away and when people really feel that it's safe to be creative and then that it's useful because they are going to be heard. And the last comment speaking of the expectations of the architect. This is another very hard thing because even though we, we, I'm, I have a team of very young uh, people who are, believe in what we're doing, it's very often hard to persuade them that it is necessary to listen to the citizens uh, because they want to express themselves. Uh, because they go like, Natalia, why the hell did we study for six years in university and now we have to listen to this old lady from Kukmer? Really? She has no taste. She has not seen anything in her life, anything better than this uh, village. Why are we going to listen to her? And this is uh, a, a really, ch because for them, it means it's, it's, it, it looks like at some point it looks like I'm underestimating their uh, professional abilities and not respecting their vision. And this is something very important to explain to them. Also, also another thing which is um, very important to balance is the uh, extent to which um, the design has to be fashionable or up to date or aimed uh, at getting the Agahan Award or at getting into a um, an architecture magazine because clearly most of the architects are looking for that and as well as this is clear it's obvious that for the local people sometimes this is not the important point they don't need to get into an architecture magazine they just need something that they can own and it's very important to balance the extent of progressiveness and newness in this design um, because it has to be there. It has to create that feeling of uh, the new life coming, but it has to be limited by um, the, 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 the ability of the local people to own this design, to feel that this belongs to them, that was made for them, not for certain, some aliens who landed in their village. This is also something very important. That's very important, the ownership. Now, I think we've gone really out of time because we're supposed to finish in 70 minutes and now it's an hour and almost two hours. Uh, Khadija, back to you and thanks for everyone for their participation. Thank you. I think Khadija left us, huh? Uh, we are still here. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm there, and I was on mute. This was uh, actually thanks. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. We did extend it. We got beyond the time allocated, but hey, that was the fun of it because I think everybody was very engrossed in the presentation. And um, now, actually, I would like to turn uh, to Bisma because um, she uh, is going to close us uh, close this session and give a little thing about the next session that we're going to move into next week. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists, Farooq and his team at uh, 